one shot in the upon the higher magnification and we could see this picture where these cells with spindle or very nuclei criss crossing and making an attempt to form some kind of arrangement the cell or used to like material intervening and the lesion was not capsulated but well circumscribed so going back the lesion was circumscribed moderately cellular areas of eosinophilic not very well organized showing the appearance of your some kind of arrangement suggest you of your very okay so with that the diagnosis tendered was benign spindle cell tumor keeping in reserve because uh, the verke bodies if we confirm that it is going to be a schwannoma usually the schwannomas are capsulated and going by the clinical and the radiographic still we have the possibility of having the another spindle cell tumor which is of odontogenic origin that is your odontogenic fibroma now odontogenic fibromas are very rare in the posterior and altogether this is a rare tumor but more commonly seen in the anterior segments of the jaw so that possibility but you are also aware that these particularly this tumor can show the presence of cytokeratin islands a very innocuous included epithelium which can also be sometimes very well appreciated but here the classical the wavy or the fasciculus which would more favor of a benign peripheral nerve sheath tumor was then the most likely diagnosis so to confirm went on with the evidence chemistry for s100 and sox10 where you could see a diffuse intense expression of s100 overall throughout the tumor plus uh, sox10 expression was also evident now this confirms the diagnosis for your the benign peripheral nerve sheath tumor and since it is a diffuse one so the diagnosis for your what you call it the schwannoma favors and you are aware that the neurofibroma shows focal positivity while diffuse positivity for s100 or the soft end can favor for the schwannoma so the diagnosis rendered was central Schwannoma, and you are aware that central schwannoma is are the very rare. Although schwannoma is a very common soft tissue tumor, what we see even in the oral region, the most common sites being ever the tongue, the floor of the mouth, and other region. But look here, this is a region where you are more likely to see one of the tumors, and we appreciated this mesenchymal tumor in this place. so it is a very rare to see schwannoma intraosseously or what we call as central schwannoma but quite interesting when you try to analyze the central schwannoma mandible is the most common site to be appreciated so keeping in that point now mandible is the most favored site for the occurrence of central schwannoma and they remain asymptomatic that was what with this patient also and radiological it is radio lucent majority of the signs and it is very well defined and most important histologically when we talk about these schwannomas in the slide discussion we say majority of the time we that is how we differentiate neurofibroma versus schwannoma schwannomas are always capsulated while neurofibromas are circumscribed may not be capsulated but interestingly most of the central schwannomas also remain uncapsulated so that can be sometimes misguiding you and especially when you have positive of your anthony b cells and anthony b cell a and b cells in this case also we did have the difficulty in appreciating the well formed anthony b so probably that what made us to think in lines of first benign peripheral nerve sheath tumor now coming back to the origin these central schwannomas are known to arise from usually the nerve and you know that even the soft tissue schwannomas most of these will be in the vicinity of the regional peripheral nerve and so here 
the central medullary can be the origin for most of the tumors and that's what it will be called as a primary tumor when it is showing the link or association to be originating from the primary canal or the regional nerve. So in this case, when you go back to your radiograph, that's what I was talking about. If you closely observe there, where you can appreciate a serpentinous radiolucency extending anteriorly. This indicates that if you have a close look that there itself is a hint that probably you are dealing with a lesion which is arising from the nerve that is enclosed with it. So in the literature there are views or in the sense appreciated different looks that have been described. One popularly especially when the tumor arises from the posterior, what we call it as the tail of a whale appearance. Now this is in the anterior segment probably serpentinous appearance which has originated from the, the inferior linear now, so we dealt with the case of the most common soft tissue tumor but in a very unlikely place that is in the posterior part of the mandible and remember radiologically it was showing aggressive signs of resorption of the roots simulating your most commonest rhododendric tumor and the commonest rhododendric cyst that is OKC and the angloblast. So you should be familiar with some of the most unusual or the careful observation of the radiologic features can help you and help you even in the histological differential diagnosis. So that was about the first case. We move on to the second case. This was in a 65 year old female in the right side of the face and the duration which started around 6 months before. It was a full swelling. But she noticed the loss of 3 teeth in the same area. But very soon she also developed pain and arrhythmia. So that was an interesting thing for this woman. Then, intraoral examination revealed a soft tissue swelling, which we could feel it mainly in the buccal vestibular area. It was firm, extending from almost premolar to the molar region obliterating the vestibule. It was not hard, bony hard, like what we had seen in the first case. And interestingly, there was no expansion or no elevation, cortical expansion on the palatal side. Mainly the lesion was appreciated on the buccal side without any much effect on teeth. So we can anticipate now, we are looking into a 65 year old uh, swelling in the posterior maxilla. First, you should rule out usually of the odontogenic box. So usually odontogenic lesions are known to cause the effect on the regional teeth. So with that, when you move on to the image where you can appreciate the presence of a soft tissue shadow here, the left hand side, where you can see the extended soft tissue mass on the upper side. Somebody has to use the so now, if you can appreciate there a soft tissue swelling mass shadow which is extending in the region of the edentulus, the history of loss of the tooth, but to our surprise. When we compare with the size of the swelling and the kind of the pain patient was undergoing and going by the side, we can anticipate a lesion occupying the maxilla, but instead we are not seeing so much of loss of trabeculin there. Hardly a very subtle loss of trabeculin, which otherwise being the size could have been more, but instead if you have a closer look, you can see there, there is a slight breach in the floor of the sinus. So this is a hint that lesion which is coming from up superiorly that is from the sinus which has come down and the same thing you can appreciate very well in the CT scan there the soft tissue mass entirely filling the buccal vestibule which is not having any almost any negligible association but slightly rag borders except in the in the sense we are probably dealing with the lesion which is coming from superior compartment rather than the jaw per se. So that means 
we are not dealing probably with the lesion which is originating that is of the odontogenic origin. So this is the another view which gives more the details of this lesion where it is extending entirely right half of the maxillary sinus extending inferiorly into the alveolar region resorbing the medially that is in the lateral aspect and superior into the orbit and almost the lateral side also. Now this suggests that the lesion is going to be very aggressive. So now correlating with the clinical, the six months duration, the presence of pain, paresthesia and intraorally there is not much on the teeth but instead you are seeing the lesion occupying from the superior aspect of the sinus. So that makes it that you are dealing with probably a benign aggressive tumor or probably you are dealing with a malignant tumor which has come into the oral cavity that is opening in the buccal vestibular area. So with that we can consider the cell carcinoma of maxillary sinus as the first diagnosis keeping in view still still the possibility that you cannot rule out going by aggressiveness is your odontogenic carcinoma but the thing here is there is no effect on teeth so the, we put it usually in the last line so the possibility of having first is squamous cell carcinoma of maxillary sinus otherwise it can be a salivary gland malignant. so let us see what we see in the what you call the histological picture and try to share the slides now, this will slide. Is it visible? Yes. Now? Yes, sir. Dr. Manjula? Yes, sir. Okay. It's visible. Is it fine? All of you? Yes, sir. It is okay. visible, sir. Yes. Now, this is the distal scan image of the yes. second yes. case, the lesion which was occupying the entire maxilla. And we just scan the lesion. Now, for the postgraduate, the scanner view, usually we start with the some important things like circumscription, capsulation, cellularity, any heart tissue or mineralizing component, vascularity, cystic areas and the presence of any regional tissue including the surface epithelium. So now going by that we can see on the left hand side the surface epithelium is there where the lesion is almost very close to it. Then we have the remaining area, entire area being covered by the regional tissue. Now, we can also appreciate in the scanner view, areas of darkly staining, which are merging with the areas of light staining and the connective tissue part, which is showing slightly paler. So that means we are looking into a moderately cellular lesion. We slightly go into the higher, this is a closer view, this is where I am trying to show the region which was very close to the epithelium. That means the approach was from the intraoral to the lesion that is the oral epithelium and we could see the lesion in the form of small strands and in between centrally occupied the solid areas, teeth slide merging with, we can also appreciate now the interconnected trabecular light pattern with intervening connective tissue stroma slightly we can at this point make out that it is mixoid also fibrocollagenous, mixoid so then within which are the the area of solid plus merging with the area of your what you call trabecular then on the periphery, you can see lesion mainly in the spreading or infiltrating in the form of strands or cocks. 
So that means it is a very addressing niche. So now the closer look can I have here. I am focusing mainly on the solid areas, the areas where the cells are more hyperchromatic. Based on the appearance, you can appreciate. And you can also see occasional areas of round. That is your tubular line, the solid arrangement of the cells. As you move to your left, merges the areas with the pale staining cells and the thin cords extending at the edge, other edge you can see here, where the compressed one surrounded by a fibrous or the fibromyxoid stroma. So, quite clear now. I hope now seeing it this now, still we do you think of squamous and carcinoma now? I don't think. We can easily rule out that possibility of squamous cell now we are into a salivary gland lesion, glandular, which is showing the areas of solid admixed with the areas of this. So now, this is a high power to appreciate this. Observe now, areas of tubular or duct-like admixed with the solid sheets Yes, then see this transition. Suddenly you have this the cytoplasmic nature of the cells which are in the center or come in the periphery have pale or white. So staining property of the cytoplasmic color of these cells has now almost become pale and clear. And what about the nuclei? We can very well appreciate they are round to oval or stellate. In this case, while here you can see it's slightly more pyomorphic, and if you still appreciate, if I go to the next high power, this is what is the cellular or the cytolog. So, mild to moderate amount of pyomorphism you can appreciate, and cells surrounding the tubular and continuing with the other part and prominent nucleoli. And when you move aside, so you can appreciate now two population of cells mainly which are blending with each other. And when you appreciate here, the cytoplasm being more or less pale or clear. And see the cytoplasm here now. It is almost moderate, useful for that. And the nucleus he is almost round, a very prominent one. And more interesting part is the surrounding stroma, which is weak soft. So the stroma here varies from fibrous to mixoid. So we have mainly the cells which are placed outside, then you have also the cells which are in the forming sheets and tubules. So two kinds of cells which are forming this entire tumor and in one way you can clearly see the tumor being more pleomorphic with the cytological features of what we call it going towards malignancy. So now with all these features of what you say, the two population of cells with the tubular arrangement in the form of your trabecular or the solid along with the areas of at the periphery you can easily see the strands or the cords and the stroma being slightly fibro to big soil. So now the diagnosis possibly goes to <coughs> yes now the possibility of I will just share the screen Okay. So now we had 
So first we ruled out squamous cell carcinoma that was the possibility right from beginning till the clinical and radiographic and upon histology we ruled out that also. Now we are looking into a tumour which has occupied the entire the sinus, maxillary sinus and history of pain. Now it is going in terms of salivary gland. Now customary to rule, usually to rule out when we ask postgraduates for the slide discussion. So usually when we are with salivary gland, make it a habit that you rule out geomorphic adenoma. So that is the thing. But now in this case, was there any strong evidence that there can be a possibility of pleomorphic except for that weak soil. We don't have other. We could not see the regular, the numerous duct-like areas with the compressed, moderate, small nucleus. Otherwise, we had large cells which were making up, trying to surround these tubules few, which were not so many also. Then, a very prominent cell we could find was the cells which were looking like myothelial cells. With the what you call the staining character of both the pale staining or the intense eosinophilic staining. So the first thing that is that comes to mind with the minimal duct-like structures and the mixoid is there, a slight similarity could be your myotidioma, no doubt about it. But the classical areas of mixochondroid will that will also rule out, but need not be a compulsion. Till then, the possibility of myotidioma was there. But you know that the distinction between the two, the first thing for myopilomai that is very well circumscribed. In the scan overview, we could see that the borders were very much infiltrated. So the possibility of that and considering the higher cytological features there and main thing, myopilioma and myopilial carcinomas usually have multinodular group and the presence of a predominant either your plasma cytoid with your highline cells. So that thing was missing. So the possibility that now remains with this can be that probably we are looking into epithelial and myoepithelial carcinoma. So although the diagnosis was very close to it, still we thought we'd go with this because it was in an old lady and the site was unusual. The IHC marking for the markers for calponin, COX-10, SMA, 63, 60, 7 then also with 20 and data 3 to rule out the possibility of the other source. So before that, before we go into the what you call the actual immunoprofile of this tumor for the benefit of the postgraduates, little bit we'll try and have this uh, preliminary idea and then we'll try to understand that. Now this myoptilial cell, as you are aware, it is a flat, small, elongated cell which is usually obscured in the normal histology. It cannot be appreciated very well, but it becomes appreciable once it is in its neoplastic form. That's what uh, Madam Borges has called it very well, that is by the name Cinderella. So this cell becomes very well appreciable in various morphologies when it is in the neoplastic proliferation. So this cell, according to so many investigators and the studies, has shown that Varieties of morphologic shapes we can appreciate with this particular tumor. That is, it is this particular cell that is in the form of stellate or mixoid, spindle or myoid, plasma cytoid or what we call it high line because of cytoplasmic staining, or it can be clear also or epithelial. And interestingly, depending on the shape of this particular morphology. There are staining characters with the markers that are available to stain this particular cell. That is with S100. Now, mainly the S100 will the first come when it is for the stellate or mixoid. Or when it is spindle, you have to choose more of myomentin and then actin and myosin. And when it is plasma cited, start with CK and then myomentin and then S100. And clear cell goes for predominantly for cytokeratins and actin, myosin and S100. So, this is the hint what the guideline we have to follow when we are trying to select immunohistochemical markers when you are trying to appreciate the, the presence of myothelial cells so selection of marker has to be in guidelines so this will help a lot based on the morphology what you are looking into you can select the mark so the panel of markers usually that are available already for the myoptilian cells, we have 
the so many now, including your smooth muscle actin, calconin, G, FPP, maspin, nespin, soxtan, S100, P63. Now, the interesting thing about here is, you all know that this myoptelial and the basal cells are considered to be abnormal. So now there is some, uh, what you can say, overlapping when it comes when we use these some of these markers, which still can be differentiated and which we can appreciate. That is P63 will stay in positive for both. In the sense, both the cells will express P63. It is mainly on the spatial location. Probably you have to deal with whether it is going to be basal. And CK14 and 18 both are stayed, but. S100 is negative for basal while myopilil is positive. But PSL2 is positive for basal and negative for myopilil. So, this what you call the uh, profile of these uh, common use markers, these students you should be aware in conjunction with the morphological appearance of these cells. And the next uh, luminal cells which are also in the interplay, we should be aware of like serous and mucus SMI, markers of CK18 and 7, they are both of them positive, so sometimes it may not be useful. So that's why we should select the marker in line with morphology and their particular appearance. Next, the most important, most commonly used are MUX, different mucins that are used, and please be noted that the expression or the appearance of these markers in normal histology or salivary gland in neoplastic you should be aware. So you can see here now MAC4, MAC4, MAC2, 5 and 3 are usually expressed in the normal salivary gland while MAC6 is not in normal salivary gland. So now that but very well expressed in most of the malignant tumors. So that is that can be helpful when you talk about the different uh, what you call MAC series what we use for staining. So with that brief note then this comes this is much much more one important statement we can make all the salivary gland malignancies that is neoplasia CK7 positive and majority of the cytokeratins especially CK7 is considered to be except CK20 which otherwise recognizes the distance from the other side. So now this case we had a very well intense positivity for P63. You can appreciate there in the trivaculate in the left hand side, almost all the all the cells have taken up for P63. And calconin also, barring few in the luminal side. And CK7, very interesting. You can see mainly the luminal cells, mainly luminal cells have taken up. That is the role of your luminal here. Then SMA. And S100 was hardly seen in this case while a good number of cells or good staining for toxin was visible. And of course, the negative for CK20 and GATA3 was done. So that is to rule out the possibility of the other considering the age and the time. So with this, the diagnosis we can arrive considering the clinical, the imaging then the histological what we have seen and including although IHC may not be uh, regularly needed but still then sometimes if you in such cases like the abnormal site of the age you can take it um, where the tumor diagnosis was rendered was epithelial and myopithelial carcinoma. This is a very less complex tumor which occurs due to the interplay of two types of cells inner ductal lining cells and outer clear myopithelial. It is considered to be a low grade malignancy, low grade, although sometimes can be aggressive. Sparatin is the most common, followed by tongue or the buccal. But the sinonasal epithelial myopilial carcinoma are also equally important. And that's what is the case what we had today here occupying the right maxilla. And histologically, most of these tumors are not capsulated but very well circumstance. Although they appear to be but usually they are circumstance. And a very classical appearance is usually what we see the classical form or considered to be easier bilayer. 
their inner luminal darkly staining cells and outer clear myoptical cells very easy to identify very easy to identify we will see this again in the one more case in the fifth case another salivary gland i tell you so there we can appreciate the bilayered appear but this particular case was not showing the frequent appearance of bilayered but instead it was occupied by a trabecular or tubular trabecular arrangement with lot many cells showing the clear morphology so in this epimyoptilic carcinoma it is shown that both the variation the proportion of these luminal to abluminal that's what we see in all the tumors also in this case much of it was occupied by myoptilial component and that's why we could see lot of mixoid areas also so that is the thing here and very rarely we can have the other high grade transforming variant and the newly recognized entities of oncocytic or apocrine subspecies and double clear epimyoptilial carcinoma which goes for clear cell so differential diagnosis now pleomorphic adenoma as we discussed may not be especially when we have the double layer that is your bilayered one very easy easy to identify pleomorphic adenoma the presence of chondromyxoid and adenoid cystic carcinoma that is one which has to be seen there so that we'll see that in the other point of discussion the other cytological features and the presence we can easily make out and the combination type then comes the most uh, what you call the worrying is when the tumor is occupied by a predominantly clear cell component where you have to consider analyzing clear cell uh, entity clear cell mbc clear cell adenoid cystic carcinoma or a very rare possibility of metastatic clear cell carcinoma so we end up with that second case of epimyoptilial carcinoma move on to the third case this is a bit uh, interesting a 34 year old male presenting with soft tissue swelling in the anterior mandibular region for four months duration i have only the intraoral uh, picture here and that's what the appearance of the lesion intraorally now how do you describe a solitary for exophytic growth in relation to the anterior mandible extending buccolingually and we can upon examination the lesion, the consistency was for okay now uh, and there was also history of tooth loss there that's what the patient had uh, said about and i think it was around one month before the size attained this particular size now if you observe clearly the uh, post graduates you see on the labial side there is a prominence of capillaries blood capillaries prominent this is one important hint we should always keep it in mind any soft tissue swellings with the prominent capillaries is little bit will guide you or hint you that you are looking into some other type or the type of the lesion what you are looking in so that's one important finding there now what could be the differential diagnosis yes very common the focal reactive overgrowth occurring in the mandibular anterior that's okay that's fine but what about the size what about the consistency very rarely we get especially the focal fibrous hyperplasia or organizing but the size matters usually that's not the size usually attained in this but there is also history of loss of tooth so the possibility next comes for is mesenchyme but mesenchyme will in the gingival region that again is your fibrous growth otherwise the other types of mesenchymal growth are common in the other parts of the soft tissue could be buccal vestibule or the lip or anything now if you leave that now then comes malignant but so far there is no any uh, what do you call the feature that would suggest you of malignancy probably we can think of it when we see or suggest you when you look into the now next that is imaging that is in the cgct crop image we can very well appreciate that the soft tissue mass extending in the sense occupying the edentulous region of the previously occupied teeth and that's a mandibular anterior and if you closely observe their extensor radiolucency slightly that is in the benign inferiorly and closer observation you can see some opacities some kind of radio opacity so it's a mass which is showing opacities 
and the right hand side you can also see the ragged borders of the lesion so that means probably the lesion has started below and moved up of tissue extension it has come out now so that you are dealing with so now <coughs> sorry going into the clinical and the radiographic now um, you can see the sorry <coughs> the other parts of these sections <coughs> the radiolucency that means lesion has originated from the medullary portion you can see the rag and the edges of the both the cortices there labial as well as the lingual and the lesion moving up into the superior that means there is a soft tissue extension from medullary and the mass which has come tumor mass which was firm and fibrous into the <coughs> oral cavity in the edgeless region of the insides so with that the diagnosis now i have put it as osteosarcoma now why did we come directly here all this time it was not there in the picture now looking into the radiography you have mass you have a lesion which is in the edgeless region and causing resorption or arising from medullary and you are very well aware that osteosarcomas do present clinically more like a pyogenic or a focal reactive overgrowth or even a peripheral osteoid fibro that is a very common presentation you should be aware of now you may be thinking when it is osteosarcoma why did we not see sunburst appearance and please remember sunburst is very rarely seen in osteosarcoma of the jaws in fact garrington sign that is your periodontal ligament widening space that is the most commonest and consistent feature for osteosarcoma so i would go with the kind of radiographic appearance there i would be include first as a osteo because this given the site given the presentation i would go with that and that to osteo sarcoma but you can also think of lymphoma now lymphomas the gingival regions are the, again the second most common region next to your palate other areas for especially the non hodgkins lymphoma which can also look like your focal reactive work <coughs> and the last option i have given is odontogenic carcinoma because site is uncommon odontogenic carcinoma is most common in the posterior and the kind of presentation the age age is elderly whereas age and the site and the radiographic fits more for the malignant that to osteosarcoma while lymphomas and odontogenic carcinomas elderly age and lymphomas may not go with that kind of radiography so the overall the correlation more goes for it is considered to be odontogenic uh, sorry uh, osteosarcoma now this was also a case given from the prior practitioner from periphery so he had accepted lesion and it was multinodular on brassing or to heart the consistency this is what one we could see the was in some areas we could see felt feel the very hard consistency of the mass of the tumor of the lesion so let us see what we are going to appreciate in the histology so this is how the tumor looked in the scanner view i have a close look there area of the dark staining mesophilic and the pale staining and you can easily appreciate some kind of arrangement and if you observe there the overlying epithelium also that means lesion is very close to the epithelium that is that's what we saw in the radiogram top tissue extension so pale staining if you are able to you can make it out now you can also look it looks like your chondrite tissue and the dark is staining did not be able to decide what it is now these are the other areas very clear the area of chondrite like or cartilage like surrounded by these cellular areas surrounded by these cellular areas and somewhere we could also see eosinophilic area the right hand side picture the lower half you can see area of pink or eosinophilic material with the areas are the surrounded by these dark staining cells and other 
If you can see the streams of these darkly staining cells, sometimes they were looking like spindle and uh, very honestly to accept, we could not assert them exactly in the beginning, maybe due to the crush artifact, the exact shape, but they were most of them were showing a spindly form. Then intervening this eosinophilic matrix and certain areas of dystrophic calcification. Then right hand side the other area for this the slide image, this slide image is corrupted so I put these slides here. So we could also see areas of this. So this is an hyper area where I am trying to show you the area of cartilage surrounded by these spindle shaped cells. And the left hand side photograph, observe carefully, there appears a calcification in the form of a thin strand like where you also call it as a filigree or your chicken wire like calcification. Then you have darkly staining cells surrounding in between. So now you have a tumor in a 30 plus year old male clinically showing an aggressive feature, radiographically showing to arise from medullary portion with the rag borders and very well going in terms of clinically and radiologically in terms of osteosarcoma. Now the picture is cartilage with this. Now where are we to be fitting? Or are we looking into an osteosarcoma of chondroid variant? Now if you want to look or if you want to call this now or rule out that possibility, we need to look again. So what are the findings now? So there were areas of cartilage or lobules or rock, not very well defined, abruptly intervening areas of good areas of spindling which were merging with this and we could find areas of reactive bone, reactive bone, okay. Now <coughs> possibility lies here now, so going by the sign, the radiographic, the age, let us rule out first the chondroid area of osteosome. So in the area so far whatever we had searched for, we could not find a malignant cartilage. Now whenever you want to go into the malignant, uh, what you call, the bone with the cartilage, and just focus on one slide here for the benefit of postgraduates. Okay, I hope uh, one minute. Okay. So now, I hope you are appreciating this place, uh, this is not, we can see, this is of the osteosarcoma, what I am showing now, this is just to make familiar about the postgraduates, how the chondroid appears in an osteosarcoma, okay, now, this so was the case of fibroblastic variant, so you can see here the area of chondroid surrounded by cellularity. Anywhere, anywhere the area you see here, lot of this was the fibroblast variant, that's what I said. You can classically see another one. Now please observe, when you want to differentiate a chondroid variant of osteosarcoma with the other chondrosarcoma. Now here, now this is, you have to look for the peripheral areas of the surrounding cartilage. If there are a lot of cellularity, adjoining cellularity which blend with that areas of chondroid, probably you are hitting with the area of or a case of chondroid variant of osteosome. Plus, you have to demonstrate the presence of your malignant osteo. That's what we can see here. There, there are moving my cursor. The area of malignant osteo. That is the osteoid eosinophilic material osteoid that is secreted by malignant bizarre cells or anaplastic. This case was in fact fibroblastic, it was not so pneumotic. But so demonstrating a malignant osteoid along with the presence of very cellular tissue, the spindling or the presence at the periphery in a chondroid would label this as what we call it a chondroid variant of osteo and if you are ruled out that probably you are looking into chondroid sarcoma. So in case of 
this, we could not appreciate the areas of malignant osteoid. That means we were in the area of contrasol coma. So now going at the level of clinical and other, we have ruled out the possibility of the chondroid or osteosarcoma. Now we are landed in chondrosarcoma. In the chondrosarcoma, you know that chondrosarcomas are very rare in the jaws. And now the question is, it is not only the cartilage, we are seeing two things, that is what is biphasic. So you have two set of, of the phases of tissue here. One is a cellular, which is usually spindle, what we have seen. The other was a cartilage, which was not so malignant. In the sense, the cartilage which was not showing a very high malignant feature. So, but it was the abnormal chondroid which was present in relation to these two. So that means probably they are looking into mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. Now, how your clinical and radiographic would help here? Now remember, chondrosarcomas conventionally are more in the age of elder, above 50. Now, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is the one which can occur below, so usually the third and the fourth decade. So that can be of help clinically and radiographically the opacity and soft tissue extension usually a feature of mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, although it was mimicking lot like your osteosarcoma. So to resolve the problem, we went on to confirm with, no, sorry, this is another area, I have taken one of from the article to show you the left hand side is a osteosarcoma chondroid where you can see peripherally cellular cells, while in case of the chondrosarcoma, there is abrupt that is, it directly arises from and there are no cellular areas surrounding. But this was a case of, in our case, it was of the mesenchymal chondrosal. So now, as I said, to solve this problem, we went on with the immunochemistry help, wherein you can see that the CD9 expression was seen mainly by these spindle cells, most of the areas, and you can also see that epithelium is not taken up that ensures your staining and the another area where I have taken wherein you can see the cartilage is not being stained while the surrounding cells are being stained for 89.9 and made an another staining with S100 to make sure that the cartilage so that's what the focal staining of S100 so that confirmed that we are looking into the case of mesenchymal chondro sarcoma in a 39 year old male. Now, this is a very rare tumor to know, know, known to occur both in bone and soft tissue, bone and soft tissue. It can also occur in the soft tissue. And the most commonest afflicted age group is going to be the third decade. And this is a biphasic tumor. The only problem we face usually or the histopathologist is going to be, that's what I said, differentiation from the chondroid variant of osteosarcoma, which can be very well if you have a closer look and train your eyes to identify malignant osteoid. Even if a one little malignant osteoid is there, no doubt about it, you are looking into osteoid. Now, going by the prevalence and incidence, osteosarcomas are more common, definitely. So, it is prudent to roll out the chondroid variant of osteosarcoma, then go for the next part as literature says about the cellularity. So the, the cellular population what usually is around cells, some of them say that they have a hemangiomeric pericytomatous pattern. Now there are two observations done here. The cellular thing what the population we see, we may have spindle or round and this is the one which is in the, the undifferentiated form which is going to give rise to the malignant cartilage and now these cells sometimes this these particular population may not show hemangiopericytoma now this has got a lot of implication on the treatment aspect the one without the hemangiopericytoma pattern is more chemotherapy sensitive for chemotherapy and radiosensitive so that is how the histological parameters can be of help when you are looking into these tumors and that is what is about mesenchymal chondrosal. So that was the third case. So you should be uh, uh, familiar of what you can say with the commonest malignant tumors, what we see, what is their mode of presentation and the very details of a common radiographic 
the features that can be of great. And as I said, there were prominent capillaries. This is usually a feature of soft tissue malignancy. Even it can be with uh, salivary gland malignancies or lymphomas or the soft tissue sarcomas. When they present clinically, can show the prominent capillaries on the surface, which can be a great hint when you are looking clinical. So we move on to the fourth case. A 28 year old female who presented with the multiple swellings of tongue and also had a burning sensation. He complained of frequent burning sensation. And she had attended several dentists for which she was then we had she also gave a history of the numbness of hands and joints for which she took medication but although she could not specify what kind of medication it was but she was a case of the rheumatoid arthritis this was what her uh, medical history revealed. Now upon intraoral examination we could appreciate presence of multiple papillar or nodular coils in one especially on the right side on the lateral aspect of the tongue then on the left side also there was a solitary nodule which was slightly eroded or erosion surface was there plus in addition to that he also had the nodular mass on the left commensural area as well as on the left which for which i don't have the photograph now you also observe there the bald appearance or the deep appellated appearance of the now patient complaints of burning sensation that was the her complaint and the firmness of the tongue that's what she used to uh, say her in the, in the conversation so we have a lady with multiple swellings on both the sides of the tongue and even on the buccal mucosa so now what would be the provisional diagnosis now this is uh, by uh, very quite interesting now which we usually tell the undergraduates or even the postgraduates. Any lesion more than one site and bilateral. This should alert you a lot now. Okay? Now at this point of time, multiple swellings, especially on the left side, lateral aspect of the tongue and the right, including two, two more swellings on the buccal mucosa. So now, given the appearance of the tongue only, the first possibility could be a crenated tongue. But you know the crenated tongue has the appearance of the arches very classically. And then the excessive hyperplasia is there, probably it can be traumatized. Otherwise, this has a different appearance. But she also had soft tissue swellings on buccal mucosa. Now, the possibility considering the multiple swellings, the age and the firm nature clinical examination goes in favor of multiple neurofibromas. That is that's what we thought of. And the second was. Can it be a case of the lesions with multiple granuloma or chronic granuloma condition? That, that is also possible with the giving the remote chance for the Crohn's. So you have the diseases too in mind now, multiple neurofibroma because they are the one where you can have multiple neurofibroma most commonly on the tongue also. Considering that we went on with that, then that made us that we go for the biopsy. For that, a routine investigation, only the slight fighting was raised DSR. And you know that she has she is a case of rheumatoid arthritis. So upon biopsy, the histopathology, we could see this picture. So the first place the neurofibromas. So we were not seeing anything of that kind here, especially in the submucosal region or the connective tissue. So that part is ruled out. Now, granulomatous also could not be appreciated. Instead, we could see a more eosinophilic to anthophilic. Now, the initial slide, what we had was eosinophilic. This was, again, we had given it for the medical college, where they had also got the similar, what you call, the picture. So now, the incisional biopsy, the histopathological appearance is neither of for a neurofibroma nor for Granulomatous. Instead, we were looking into a case with 
the presence of a cellular amphiphilic material almost occupying this sub mucosa and the deeper part so now comes a different channel that's what you have to start with what all things can appear hyaline or amphiphilic that to a cellular use method so the most common to begin with it can be fibrin from the areas especially one where you are seeing hemorrhage with other thing then most common what we regularly see fibrosis hyalinization or osteoid but remember osteoid or dentinoid you also see the entrapment of the other cells there it cannot be totally a cell wall or the ghost cells you are aware now especially the areas where coilous ghost cells lot of areas where you see the fusion of ghost cells there you see lot lot of a cell wall used to collect or just now we had seen vertebrae bodies but still then peripherally surrounded by the spindle cells very spindle cells so that means you should be aware of and most common at over that is your necrosis but necrosis surrounded again surrounded by inflammatory cells so you can make algorithm of various uh, or cellular use of it then you are trying to make here now what fix here now you also should be aware of the one which is going to be uh, eosinophilic cellular is the graft gingival grafts or collagen grafts which are given they also can but only thing is they may polarize that is once you apply the special investigation so that is what is the thing here you should be aware of a cellular eosinophilic components of kind the sub epithelial or the submucosal area so that was the one so that prompted us to think for uh, what usually we observe you know that what we call it amyloid and one of the most important tumor which is well very well appreciated for it to be that is your cvot or pitbulls tumor where we see a cell or usually implicate they are intervening on so this is taken from the other case but when that is stained with the congor red that is how you are going to see that in the background a cell are well circumscribed round congor red thalmon pink appear so with this line we subjected this particular case for congor red and in the first it is altered you then uh, it is quite common and it is always best to have second opinion or send the slide for some other lab and get it stained then you are not getting it so this is a second stain where we got it positive in the first when we had sent it to the the next medical college we could not this was given to the one of the commercial lab where we could see the appreciation the presence of a cellular bright magenta pink salmon pink the color of the material which we had seen in hnd deposited sub epithelially extending the sub mucosa entire this region so that means the material has stayed congruent positive and when you visualize with the fluorescent you are going to see the pattern and to confirm ourselves we went on to go for the immunohistochemistry chemistry that is for the stappa immunoglobulin and it stained intense bright expression for stappa and for the the moderate staining for the lambda so now that means we are dealing with the ursinal eosinophilic material that was deposited sub epithelially in the nodule which was a, the clinically appearing a nodule so that means probably we are dealing with in a sense confirmed with the case of amyloidosis so a very rare disease very rare to come across now this particular disease either it is a systemic or localized disease which is characterized by accumulation of extracellular or fibrillar proteinaceous material extracellularly and that results in the clinical presentation of various swellings or various forms of of plaque that's what is going to be now this particular amyloidosis as you all know can be of three types very clear cut now primary and localized please remember they will not have any medical conditions associated purely the first primary entirely it is going to involve different multi organ but no association of any medical problems concomitant medical conditions like arthritis or multiple myeloma or any other even in form of local only localized differences it is confined to one organ 
localized. So initially we thought it can be a case of localized amyloid disease, but with the history wise, that is what is the secondary amyloid disease talks about, wherein most of the times they have a medical condition with multiple myeloma associated or rheumatoid arthritis. And she was a case of rheumatoid arthritis. So these amyloidosis cases presentation varies with the severity and the type of organ involved. So, and accordingly, you are aware that oral involvement is going to be very, very rare. Although it is very rare in oral, tongue is the most common site for amyloid deposits. So, this was a case of the amyloidosis presenting in tongue and followed by buccal mucosa, wherein the presentation noted in the literature is going to be varying from papillar or nodules or plaque and sometimes even they can present with the firm, the what you call it macroglossia. Although she did complain of, the patient complained of firmness, firm tongue, we could not notice macroglossia but instead there was bald tongue, okay, deep papillated appearance was there but the presentation was papillar or nodular or even plaque but the color was red. Although most of the time amyloidosis can present with yellow or orange color or even purple. So we noticed red color, we did not notice any orange or the other color appreciation. And another interesting, it can also present sometimes with a simple, uh, what you call refractory periodontal problems or the gingival problems where histopathological evaluation becomes the main state to rule out why the patient is not responding to conventional periodontal or gingival therapy in absence of the systemic manifestation. So for the information for postgraduate, this is taken from an article where this is just to show the color, orange color lesions in amyloidus. You can have the orange color lesions. Of course, in this case, in our own patient, we had red. So that is what the clinical presentation of amyloidus can be. And the diagnosis or amyloidosis starts with light microscopy, I believe starts with clinical, multiple lesions, careful medical evaluation and this particular case we had the medical evaluation and unfortunately patient was not cooperative and we later realized or came to know that she passed away because of renal problem and that is what is usually the cause in most of the amyloid cases, the problem of cardiovascular or the renal. So diagnosis should start with clinical light microscopic presence of your characteristic ursula or eosinophilic. Then special saying the role of congruent or theoflavin, confirmation with immunohistochemistry or the higher X-ray diffraction and electron microscopic appearance for the fibrilla arrangement or the test. So that would complete the diagnosis for amyloidosis and you should know now the take home message for the post graduates any case with multiple or bilateral should always raise a suspicion of systemic association. This, this is a strong thumbnail, you can say that this is any, it can be your soft tissue manifestation or it can be your heart tissue manifestation, <laughs> multiple bilateral, please rule out any cause of systemic, that's what you should search in for and you should go for. So that was a case of amyloidosis, move on to the fifth case. Then another 60 plus or lady female. Now this female, she was very close to my hometown. She presented with the problem she started with uh, was headache, clear headache. And she met several ophthalmologists who inquired her to go for the change of her glasses and examination. Only the third ophthalmologist referred the case to the ENT. Then back the patient was referred to our case or oral surgeon. So total the duration of the presentation was somewhere 4 to 5 months. And we could also appreciate slight change in her gaze, eye. And this was the appearance from the intraoral. And we could only see, the only the thing we could appreciate was slight swelling in the left mid face or intraorally we could see slight swelling in the premolar or canine region slightly obliterating the vestibule otherwise no effect on teeth now in this case also although we should roll out 
preferably the odontogenic. So the first cause can be a odontogenic lesion in a 60 plus. But remember, there was no effect on the teeth here also, this case also. And this was amazing. Since it was a referred the case, we did not have a CT, but MRI was done. So surgeon thought to move on with this particular thing. So the large mass occupying the left maxillary sinus, slight erosion, you can see superiorly to the orbital floor. Otherwise, the lesion was considered to be fairly well defined and the radiologist opinion in the first place was the impression of a benign the, with the possibility of ruling out malignant. So, <coughs> Arjun decided to, what we call, take an incisional biopsy. This was the video sent from him. You can see there, the session is made and the mass was easily separable. That's what the clinical interoperative note was given. And uh, not so firm soft tissue. So he could even put his keratin said we can easily separate and lesion was and there is the opinion. Surgeon's opinion of the mainly could be a surgical cyst, what was usually rendered. So with the opinion of imaging and clinical, the histological evaluation showed this. Let me show you the slide. I hope you are seeing the slide now, very clear scanner view. Now again going by the rules of imputation for post diagnosis now, circumscription we cannot comment. Okay, we can see here at the periphery there are infiltration, you can see. And what about the cellularity versus non-cellularity? Okay, moderately cellular, you can appreciate the background fibrous or prominent eosinophilic, then this is what is the next low power and just move the slide around. This was at the periphery, this lesion and see there on the top the background stoma, more eosinophilic, ionized light, then the areas of cellular. Keep observing the pattern also. So now, with the clinical impression and the imaging was of a benign entity, and now site was of the odontogenic. So again, deceptive. We are now we are not seeing any odontogenic like lesion. Probably we are looking into some other. Move on to the next. Take it to the next high power. And in the excisional biopsy, the first slide when we saw, this was the area which was suddenly looking as if it was like keratin pearl. That's not the case. Keep observing this like spaces surrounded by darkly staining cells with some particular pattern, what we call it, fibriform. And duct line or tubula throughout and surrounded by fibrocollagenous from almost everywhere except for at some areas at the periphery you can see it here more highlights more highlights here otherwise falls going to be that the next this is what is the at the higher magnification you can clearly see there So the true duct like and pseudocystic appearance, tubular, 
torus diagnosis is almost straight forward observe the surrounding stroma now at the periphery sometimes you see strands through the and that's what so and this is one area you can observe here hydrophobic degeneration like or sometimes you have erroneous impression of sebaceous differentiation so that is what is the picture there so more and now if you going to go back to the what is called the picture it is more or less we are seeing the cribriform areas cords clusters and at the periphery hardly so that means we were not seeing any areas this is a, what was the tissue available to us areas of the solid one we could see mainly of the cribriform areas and the tubular duct we had most of the areas we could appreciate the true ducts that's what they described the most of the textbooks describe two types of areas we see in a most cribriform pattern the true ducts when you call it as true duct you can see it here now these two areas lined by flattened cells now what are these cells they are nothing but your angular myofilial cells which have to be differentiated so now this particular tumor had got the area of a classical cribriform along with tubular so now the post side should be aware that to differentiate the true duct and the kind of cells which line this so you have these luminal cells then have luminal that is your myofilial cells so in case of what has been customarily described in case of most of the advanced cystic carcinoma cells in myofilial like cells will have round wall or angular cells cytoplasm varying from scant to moderate so in this case cytological identity are obvious but the Cortical figures were very minimal. Hardly we could find, and not so many like what we conventionally or usually see in cases of conventional spinal carcinoma. So the diagnosis was much prevalent with the adenoid cystic carcinoma with the cribriform and tubular occupying the space. Now the thing here is going by the side. and the appearance of the lesion <coughs> we started thinking of the presence of the other lesion this is just the these images which were showing as i said and now this image you can see here now the insert also to there were areas of a double layer this was what we discussed in the second case okay double layer classical appearance visually a classical feature of epimyofilial carcinoma but we could also see in this now with this it made us to think that are we looking only to this or we want to rule out the other possibilities considering the age 60 plus uncommon sign although sinus is considered to be a common considering the age and the male we thought we'll rule out the other possibilities and subjected for the immunostic chemistry with the possibilities of the first being advanced cystic the other ones so that is what is immunostic moving profile was the first slide left hand side p63 you can very well see there bright staining intense expression mainly on the abdominal nucleus stain carbonic not very classical The sock stain was also showing mainly in the abdominal and few luminal. Okay, so now the sock stain appearance and the B63 showing 
that means the transformation the ratio of your luminal to abluminal and the staining for these luminal cells for ck19 was intense almost all the cells especially the luminal again then ck14 so the staining character of these will go in favor of that there is participation of both the cells again here okay we ruled out the possibility of the metastatic that is your ar tr was negative so in the chemistry what just helpful in ruling out otherwise confirmation of the other so it was a case of advanced carcinoma pino nasal region and nowadays pino nasal adeno carcinoma are considered to be separate entities although there is lot of similarity histologically also with the conventional glandular carcinoma it is a high grade aggressive tumor but can occur now other than the typical so typical sites you are aware now major salivary gland and the oral cavity now other sites could be the breast lacrimal or synovium including larynx they are the slow growing tumors painless masses now when it is present in the synovium late time that's what four to five months this lady was running around complaining mainly of headache the third ophthalmon is preferred and we got to see that so histopathologically the areas of the what we graded according to the prognosis cribriform tubular and solid and this case was not showing the solid although we are yet to receive the excise specimen differential diagnosis yes first comes in you have to rule out polymorphous no i would consider plg only it was oral now it is in the sinus and remember advanced cystic carcinoma in the commonest salivary gland malignancy seen in maxillary sinus if you go out with a malignant tumor seen in sinus means squamosal carcinoma if you go with malignant salivary gland that means acc comes first even in maxillary sinus so customary to rule out polymorphous aware now then pleomorphic cribriform retinocarcinoma all those occur in the minor salivary gland and oral of course salivary duct carcinoma even this has, this also can show the presence of cribriform area now polymorphous now most of them say that they can present with solid or tubular cribriform are usually less common compared to acc although it is usually more also presents with other patterns of papillary and fascicular and very classical single file pattern and uh, stroma of mucoid hyaline or mucohyaline and cells now the cytological feature that help us to rule out you are aware they are bland most important single nucleus nucleola where we you could see in this case multiple nucleoli rtpa is there but rtpa is more pronounced in scc compared to this and very interesting is cells get blurred and move out of focus when you try to just and that's what help you to affirm your diagnosis of polymorphous low grade and the vesicular nuclei bland versus the basilar appearance and pleomorphic the as i said pleomorphism nuclear pleomorphism and basilar appearance favors the acc the angular cells while they are small and it stands at plasm in plga or nowadays what we call it polymorphous adenocarcinoma and papillary or fascicular pattern are more in polymorphous than in acc and sometimes by 67 staining can be of help usually there they consider less than 60% favoring acc more than favoring so acc and less than that for polymorphous and pleomorphic a very identifiable features presence of your what you call the rhizoid or chondromycoid but one interesting sometimes you do see pseudocysts even in the what you call pleomorphic adenoma but the kind of the material that fills in there it is hyaline while in case of acc it is more metoxothin that's how we should be able to differentiate and another is basilar squamous cell which can also occur in the sinus area okay very but less common but the odd cytological features high metastatic or the dysplastic features in the overlying epithelium that is also helpful and of course salivary duct carcinoma with the presence of comedo nectrosis so that can rule out acc 
and we saw a case of ACC in the very unequal issue and what students should be aware of the clinical and radiographic and plus the histological to rule out the other common possible. We move on to the sixth case. This, this is one of the old cases where I would like to share with everyone. Very interesting case. Please have a look. Now this was a draining sinus in a 34 year old male. Okay, of the lower jaw, you could see there draining sinuses, both left and the right. So draining sinuses means the differential diagnosis starts with your most common what you call pedantral diagnosis. So that we'll see now what are the draining cause. So that's a very quite common we see most of the pulp and periapical or other things that now it is bilateral. Okay? And the patient was not a normal in appearance, abnormal face appearance and the loss of hair, there was no presence of hair, he was a dog, 34 year old and history wise he, he revealed a very typical history where he said right from beginning I did not have the presence of hair nor the presence of teeth. Please make it a point, he revealed the history that there is no presence of teeth or hair and the problem with the vision, problem with the vision and he was also a good achiever, habitual good achiever in this case and then came very interesting, the intraoral examination revealed, so it is quite but natural when you see a draining sinus, you look for the odontogenic either a carious tooth or a peridontal or any other, to our surprise thanks to the oral medicine department people where they called us and we could see this case no presence of, in the sense we could not appreciate presence of any tooth or any teeth you can see whether it is in the maxilla or the mandible in addition to that slight the fibrosis like appearance of the lower limb and both the jaws were in dentulous now the patient comes in now means what are the causes of this draining sinus how we should we deal with the draining sinus cases now? The most of the times, majority of the times, odontogenic being the cause. So that's how you uh, usually follow the algorithm when we are dealing with the cases of. Now this case of bilateral draining sinus. We ask for the history of the kind of the secretion. It can be a suropurlant or if it is bony chips, then it goes in favor of osteomyelitis. Now the question is bilateral. Bilateral means the another possibility could be your tubercular dyspnea. Okay, so now this intervening now intraorally there are no teeth. That's what the intraoral examination has shown now. But the possibility of other things also you cannot rule out here. It could be a case of bacterial mycosis or it can be tuberculosis. Now the problem here is where the teeth are or should be confirmed with your radiogram. So interestingly, radiograph gave a very surprising finding where almost we could see many teeth, many unerupted or embedded teeth both in the maxilla and mandible, although we could not figure out the outlines of these teeth. And probably now we have to believe or trust the patient that he said that right from beginning I did not have teeth nor the hair. He also revealed, I have the photograph later, where his sibling, his elder sister also did not have the teeth or the hair and two of his cousins also started having this problem who were quite younger. We had seen those cases also. So this was first time where we were surprised where we could see the complete absence of all the teeth, anodontia, what we call it anodontia, both in the lower and upper arm. But the patient also had draining sinus. Now what made this sinus to be there? then who is the cause for it? So, we are seeing the case of pseudo anodontia. That is what is being defined as a very clinical but not radiographically absent. Clinically they were absent but radiographically evident. That means there is nothing problem with the formation of the teeth or the development of the teeth. So the problem was mainly probably attributed to what? eruption. They are not erupted, they are embedded. Okay, so this is what the condition is called as pseudo anodontia. 
clinically absent but not clinically absent all the team according to his history also no deciduous ones who were not we had seen all the his younger elder sister as well as the two siblings none of them had teeth and none of them had hair and they all had the vision problem so that means again more than one bilateral there is some strong systemic association so with all the thorough evaluation with the medical and the imaging the diagnosis of what was rendered was syndrome what is called gapo g a p o g for growth retardation a for alopecia p for pseudoanodontia o for ophthalmic changes now p that is pseudoanodontia one of the consistent finding of this particular very rare syndrome very rare only so far 46 cases other than the only another four cases have been reported and to our surprise let me tell you this was a term gapo syndrome coined by our friend bob the friend bob tumor cot plus the another credit to him that is gapo syndrome the term was coined by pindberg and anderson and pseudo anodontia is one of the consistent feature what we observe in gapo syndrome okay so this was the case of gapo syndrome where these patients get come with typical cases absence of hair by the age of 3 or 4 all of them at home did not have hair either the eyebrows or maybe even the absence of the primary or the secondary uh, secondary sexual characters and the main was the senile appearance in the age of 20 30 they get the group of the old and vision problem already this boy had even the cataract glaucoma problem and the cataract his elder sister had one problem of the cataract another two were developing continuous watering of the so these were the common problems now as far as the oral manifestation the very characteristic and very rare and unusual that is protonchia and the surgeon had operated the sinuses cirrhotic because there were radio lucency surrounding his impacted teeth now what made this teeth to be getting infected or what were the focus of infection now this boy had this particular person because of appearance people used to give him money or entertain kind of entertainment so he had an habit of gutka chewing and he also had the habit of eating the kadak rotis coarse the maybe the coarse what you call the forces of the arecana and the eating habits he developed superficial laceration and that matter allow the ingress of the microorganism the more the infection to go into the underlying teeth and then there is clearing of the infection that resulted in the draining sinuses by that so that might be the case for this and during this he had also excised the part of the oral tissue which we examined histologically and this particular case the cause is now attributed to what we call it the mutations of the anthrax gene and the reason for the failure of eruption that is it so the mutation of this gene results in the defective extracellular matrix deposition and that impedes the eruption so it the cause of primary eruption failure resulting into pseudo anodontia and that is what is the histological appearance again the presence of what we had in the fourth case now deposition of the cellular mucinophile material even here looks like your high low the fibrosis so because fibrosis case we have seen now such kind of appearance the what you call the hyalinization especially the subepithelial can also be seen in another condition progeria which is also sometimes a premature aging so that can also show similar appearance and this we could appreciate even in this case so this was a case of gapo syndrome so take home message here is the presence of multiple bilateral now generalized here all of the teeth were clinically absent but radiographically present that's what a very rare very rare clinical condition what we call it pseudo anodontia and thanks to the great gentleman pedbor named after him he was the one to do describe this syndrome first time and we could also report which also got published now we come to the last one it is just a passing remark here only i want to highlight 
what what importance to be given here now these are the cases what we got in the 2021 the so called bucor mycosis or the black fungus and the specimens we received from the periphery the practitioner and some other college also and our own institute so we had we could share uh, what what we can have we looking at around 7 to 8 cases of newborn cases so most of these patients were above the age of 50 and to be precise all six cases were in the maxilla region and there were the radiographic appearance we could see most of the cases with ulceration in the palate or the multiple abscesses sudden mobility of the teeth could appreciate and sometimes we could see the denuded bone and open exposed bone a typical appearance and the specimen also and the radiographic this was another one including pus mainly in the maxillary and patient himself was able to explain that it was a mobile mobility of the maxillary reach so these were most of the six cases but we also had another things which was referred from the oral surgery also as a case of uh, post covid post covid and suspected mucor cases now this patient also had a difficulty in opening from last 3 uh, to 4 months a history of trauma and there you can see the step deformity in there on the right side so fracture this is what the radiograph the uh, ct image was showing and you can see the soft tissue mass on the left side now Going back to the intra, if you observe carefully, there is a grayish discoloration of the mucosal surface on the mandible. Now, all the pre- other cases were in the maxillary. This was in the mandible, okay. And there was a st- because it, it was in the during the same period we got this case. Probably this patient was also subjected, suspected for the mucor or in the sense the post-COVID. but this the only history was very interesting was this patient was a non covid but he was a diabetic he was diabetic okay and now we come to that case again now mucor mycosis you are aware we will not go into the details of that uh, rhino maxillary mucosa or mucor mycosis usually involves the palate the alveolar bone and there they are in mandible and presentation with the discoloration of the mucosa presentation of the swelling ulcerations sometimes multiple draining abscesses is also we see and very the other thing could be superficial necrosis with a darker rashes formation that is usually the mode of presentation in these cases and all these cases other than the covid we could see the heart tissue specimen which took the problem we faced was the calcification most of the bony specimen we could see the presence of this non septic hyphen you can appreciate here and careful observe the observe the surroundings now usually it is customary when we observe the bony samples when we do see usually we evaluate for markings otherwise it can be a case of osteomyelitis so the presence of here the fungi and this was in the soft tissue where also we could see the presence of this non septic fungi and this was of the last case what i said it was in the mandible soft tissue and where we could see the presence of granular matter inflammation affecting the entire muscular part whatever was available there and the presence of giant cells now in this case we could not ascertain the presence of mucor because clinically it was suspected case of mucor we also subjected for the gms team but we could not ascertain so this was a thing which left there so with this what i would like to highlight this case is students should be aware of and how to differentiate cases of mucor affecting bone and conventional ophthalmo this is one thing we should done now we keep telling always now especially the undergraduates or the post graduate when it comes to osteomyelitis If someone says osteomyelitis of maxilla, you think hundred times. When we say osteomyelitis, it means that I am talking about osteomyelitis of mandible. 
So invariably, very rare to see or have osteomyelitis of maxilla. You know the reasons for it. Okay. So this particular core mycosis usually involves maxillary lesion. And if you are seeing in uh, what clinically put the diagnosis of osteomyelitis of maxilla means probably you first rule out defungicating it. That's what. That is a hint. So conventional osteomyelitis involves usually mandible while fungating or defungating like mucor involves maxilla. Most of them. So that's what is the, some differences we have laid down now. Bone and soft tissue involvement, while only the mainly heart tissue involvement in conventional maxillary and paralegal sinus in mucor or mandible in the commonest. And cause being monophysionic in most of osteomyelitic cases, while immunosuppression and diabetes, although they can be precipitating there also. And drugs like corticosteroids, we have heard about so much about it, we not go into the details. And radiographic, most of these present osteolytic, while these present as more written or mixture of that. Then histologically, very interesting. In case of osteomyelitis, if you are you go, you go back to your slides and again, the cases of osteomyelitis, we have a clear picture of chronic inflammation. Presence of inflammatory cells in the interstitial tissue where surrounding the bone, it could be resorbing or it could be where, what you call it, uh, uh, the area of resorption and bone formation. Sometimes you also see the reactive bone formation of that is an osteomyelitis and presence of inflammatory cells. This is most now that is what opposite in case of mucor cases. See, this is a case of immunosuppression. So most of the cases we could not appreciate the presence of inflammatory component. We could see the bare sterile looking like your fungi which are bloating. So that should be an hint and what you are looking into and when it is in soft tissue it can also present as a granulomatous inflammation. So that is what is just uh, to share this information what a postgraduate should be aware how to differentiate or how to get an idea or get a hint that you are looking into osteomyelitis versus mucormycosis involving bone and I think that uh, brings to the end of my presentation with few cases what we had in our institute and now this is not the case the slide which I am sharing with on the top you can see a very popular pic which was there revolving around the group of ladies which made us proud we can call them heroes and so is the case with another pic here down this team I have been seeing them years now right from my post graduation under the leadership of Madam, Alka Madam, and the very simple thing, not to examine here, the thing here is, these people are one step at a time, one step at a time, one task, and very, in the low profile, things are done, and we have seen that is a testimony what was done in the beginning of the presentation, last 13 years, this discussion is going on, along with the other, so I did not. So thank you so much for giving an opportunity to share my few cases, whichever there, and anything uh, flaws or in the sense, any shortcomings, I accept maybe the technical difficulties in the beginning. So that is, bring, brings an end to my presentation. Uh, Dr. Manjur, any questions? Yes. Uh, sir, you can uh, take it from the chat box, sir. Sir, you can take it from the chat box, sir, if any questions are there and if you'd like to answer them. I can take it out. You can just take it out. I can just take it out. Open it. Uh, sir, I think there are no questions. Okay, okay. Anything like that, uh, you can switch on to the this one. Okay. And uh, let me wind up then. Two minutes. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Last two more slides. Okay. Thank you to everyone. So, 
my personal thanks to our own oral medicine and other departments and oral and metaphysical surgery and two of our referral surgeons dr tirumal rao from ranchur who keeps on sharing good cases the misakaman contest are from of his and dr sagar udgatti from mudod also shares lot of cases and regularly regular or rare then my own department our own people all of us are very familiar face dr shrinivas dr shukumar madevi pravin pramod and two of our pgs i am very thankful to them in helping me out to prepare this presentation and thank you once again thanks kl team thank you madam and thank all the seniors i forgot to thank all the seniors who are at this board uh, uh, sushmita saxena madam jyoti madam everyone so thanks a lot thank you very much i end my presentation and any queries suggestions please send me mails or anything in the whatsapp number also i can help you out thank you one and Uh, thank you, sir. Though there was a technical delay and technical glitch, uh, you were able to present it uh, very nicely, and you showed enigmatic cases and highlighted the importance of uh, clinical pathologic correlations for unraveling their diagnosis. And I'm sure that most of our students and faculty are immensely benefited by your presentation. Your abundant knowledge and enthusiasm is an inspiration for all, sir. Oh. Uh, now I invite Dr. Uh, Veena Nayak, ma'am, to give vote of thanks and present his certificate to Puranik sir. On behalf of the organizing committee of third national and thirteenth regional slide seminar, I deem it a pleasure to propose the vote of thanks. We are privileged to have an encouraging management headed by. honorable chancellor dr prabhakar kore and vice chancellor dr vivek sauji who have always been supporting such academic initiatives and faculty development programs we are thankful to president and secretary iaomp for allowing us to organize this slide seminar under the aegis of iaomp who better would it be than dr puranik to unravel the clinical pathological correlations with his vast knowledge and clinical approach thank you dr puranik our sincere thanks to all the participants who joined the meet in large number thanks to our electrical and it section who made this online event possible thank you one and all yeah now we would present e certificate to dr puranik thank you sir thank you thank you so much thank you thank you once again Alpha uh, Madam, Sima, Dr. Meena, everyone. Thank you all for your patient listening, and we are, we are ending the meeting here. Have a good day. Thank you. And I request all the delegates to fill the feedback form so that they'll get the e-certificate through their mail.